Hello, party people, and welcome to Tel Aviv, the last office hours I'll do in Tel Aviv, for this trip at least. Uh, getting ready to take a walk down the shoreline to the old part of Tel Aviv called Yaffa. Uh, that does, uh, it's kind of like Brooklyn for Tel Aviv. It's got a lot of old shops, uh, hipster restaurants, things like that. It's a nice uh, place to spend the morning. Um, so I figured I'd stop and uh, do some quick office hours and give you one last view of the beach here uh, before I head back over to Vegas. So the top voted question is from all the party people. All the party people asks, on our server, max stop equals one. We had a poor performing stored procedure. I ran it in management studio, it ran fine. It failed in the web, it worked in SSMS. Yeah, so this is a really common thing, There's and it pops up all the time in office hours. What you want to do is search for slow in the app, fast in SSMS. It's been such a big thing, uh, we've joked around it for so long in the community that people will say, you know, sometimes they'll start a timer with how long it takes on each webcast before that one to come up. And it, it never ceases to amaze me that it's it just is a never-ending problem for SQL Server. The short answer to it is that SQL Server can cache different execution plans depending on your connection settings, which leads to further problems with parameter sniffing. This is a problem that still isn't fixed in SQL Server 2022. The upcoming 2022 has the, still has this slow in the app, fast in SSMS problem. And I, I kind of laugh about it when people say, oh, database administrators are doomed. You know, they're, they're being automated out of a job. This is still a problem in SQL Server 2022, and it's not even documented well in the product. There's nothing to alert you that it's happening. So I think those of us who do performance tuning and database administration, our jobs are safe for a little while longer. Let's see, next up we have Frankie G. Frankie G asks, hi Brent, how do I sell the SP Blitz stored procedures uh, to the owners of a client databases or a company where I'm the new person? Goodness, somebody just dropped something there. Uh, how, how do I uh, sell SP Blitz uh, to people who own the databases? So instead of selling a tool, ask them what their pain points are. Ask them what their pain points are and then say, okay, based on those pain points, here's the tool that I recommend in order to solve that problem. Uh, just like I wouldn't say, you know, if I, how do I sell to someone who wants to buy a house? How do I sell the hammer? You don't sell them the hammer. You ask them what they want built and then that's what you, what you really sell them. Next up, let's see here. APB asks, Hi Brent, I'm just curious about your thoughts on creating a view in a data warehouse with an index, a, an indexed view is what he's saying, versus creating a similar table and then truncating it and reloading it after a nightly data refresh. Which way is the most efficient? Well, APB, what a lot of people would do is test. A lot of people would run a test and find out. Not you, because you're lazy. Well, if you're lazy and you just want to take my word for it and have me do all of the hard work for you, you can go to brentozar.com, go right up to the top of brentozar.com and click consulting. And I have in my kitchen a whole bunch of spoons. What I do when you click consulting is I go to my kitchen, I get a spoon, and I spoon feed you the thing that you want. If you want me to do that work for you, I'd be glad to. But APB, the other thing that you might do is you might run an experiment inside your own data warehouse to find these things out for yourself. Because what you'll find is that it depends on your workload, it depends on your hardware, it depends on the amount of data that you're reloading each time. But again, if you'd like to buy a spoon from me, I'll even put it in your mouth as opposed to other places. I mean, if you want me to put it somewhere else, I suppose I'd be glad to. I make a lot of money putting spoons in people. Here comes the airplane. 
Uh, next up, let's see here. Medaza Land asks, I know it's amazing. Anybody ever asks ants ask questions around here? Medaza Land asks, what criteria do you use to determine whether a given long running transaction is a concern or not? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, so for me, I'm always concerned about what's going to happen when it fails, if it has to roll back. If a transaction has to roll back, rolling work forward in SQL Server is, sing is a multi-threaded. Rolling work backwards is single-threaded. So I worry about a, a queries transaction that takes an hour to roll forward across eight CPU cores. And then if for some reason it has to roll back, it's going to take eight hours in order to roll back. Um, so that, that's one problem. Another problem is blowing up the transaction log, because when you type begin tran and start doing things, SQL Server will keep most of the transaction log open for your application in case you need to do a rollback. There's a change for that in, uh, there are tweaks for that around SQL Server 2019, 2022, but most folks don't put those, don't, don't turn that on. So the worry I, I have there is the rollback. Oh, uh, next up, let's see here. Next up, Madaza Land also asks, what are the best training resources for learning SQL Server availability groups? Simple answer there is the documentation. There haven't been any third party uh, training classes that I've seen come out in the last three or four years. There were training classes several years ago uh, but unfortunately, they haven't kept up with all the new things in SQL Server with the latest in distributed availability groups, uh, availability groups on Linux, and so forth. So your best bet's the documentation. RTFM, read the fine manual. Next up, PB&J asks, hi, Brant. I'm a big fan of transactions and error handling inside stored procedures. Me too. Developers say they implement try, catch, and transactions in the application code, so they don't want to add it on the stored procedure as well. Is it indeed duplicate, or does it uh, make sense to handle errors in SQL? The place where you worry about handling errors in SQL Server is if you need to uh, have two row, or rows go into multiple objects, and you want to make sure either everything goes in or nothing goes in. If you search for transaction handling Brent Ozar, I've got a series of blog posts where I walk through and I show you why try catch alone doesn't do the trick and I teach you how to make a turkey sandwich. So another thing that I suppose you could search for is Brent Ozar turkey sandwich error handling. Uh, and in there I show you how why it's important and how to do it the right way. And why why do it catching into the application generally isn't enough. Next up, we have Ramil who asks, Hi Brent, my application controls a lot of things like the number of data files, how indexes are created, how partitioning is done. How can I scale up horizontally? Ramil, I think you've asked this question before, and again, you're confusing the terms. Scale up means larger hardware. Up, up and down, is vertical. And when you say scale up, vertically you scale up that means larger hardware on a box scale out horizontally is to add more servers like to offload queries to a readable replica so Ramil you've asked this question a couple of times I want to make sure that you're on the right track you're either going to say scale up vertically is more hardware scale out horizontally is to add more servers and spread the load amongst them. Generally speaking, you can scale up vertically, adding more hardware with no changes to the application whatsoever. Doesn't matter how the application is built, how the queries are written, just throw more hardware at it. Scaling out vertically to multiple SQL servers, the problem there is that you got to get your application to connect to those other SQL servers. That requires changing the connection string specifically for read-only queries. SQL Server won't automatically move readable read-only queries out to a separate replica because SQL Server doesn't know whether a query is going to be read-only or not. 
And I know that sounds weird for me to say, but SQL Server doesn't know when you run a stored procedure if you're going to do, for example, dynamic SQL. And if you're going to build dynamic SQL inside a stored procedure, you might have an insert, update, or delete in there. SQL Server doesn't know that. So it's up to you when you connect to the SQL Server to connect to the right one. Next up, we have Bamda. That's kind of cool. It's like Lambda, but Bamda. Bamda says, hi Brent, I've inherited a SQL Server estate where I have multiple uh, SQL servers on a single operating system. Yeah, it's called instant stacking. Uh, and I have data files on mount points. Any suggestions on how I can consolidate those servers without migrating to new ones? So, and you said in here you have 2012 to 2017. It, the problem is, is you may have applications that have dependencies on specific versions, like they do things that other versions don't allow for or support, like the vendor doesn't support running on anything other than 2012. So you have to get buy-in from everybody who's got an application on there. Hey, is it okay that we go to one version? And everybody has to go to the same newer one because you can't take a 2017 database and downgrade it to 2012, for example. So what I would say is, I would, I would look out what the end of support dates are for 2012, 2014, and then have that as a starting point for your discussions to say, all right, we're gonna go build a new 2019 instance. We're gonna consolidate things onto there as they drop off, off of support and then start migrating over to that. But you are going to want to build a new instance. Anytime you've had instance stacking on the same server, I don't want to make changes to that one. I want to go build a new safe place and gradually migrate things over to there. It ain't quick. It's going to take a lot of time and coordination. But you know what? That's why they pay you the really big bucks. I think you look fantastic today. Don't smell too good, but you look good. Uh, next up, Mehmet asks, do untrusted foreign keys ever affect execution plans? Yes, and I show you how in my class, Mastering Index Tuning. Go in the Mastering Index Tuning class, go to the foreign key modules, and I do demos of that. Uh, next up, also Mehmet asks, have you ever experienced an ailing SQL server that sent out so many failure notifications that it took down the mail server? Yes, I have done that personally uh, because personally, I was, this is probably about 15 years ago, uh, I was working for a wine and spirits company and uh, I let my developers use database mail and we had problems with database mail. One thing led to another and we got so many spiraling notifications uh, that I came in the next morning and it had filled up the, all the drive space on the mail server. I wanna say we'd sent out like 120,000 emails inside the span of an hour. It was uh, not a good time. Uh, next up, let's see here, Tim Bolero says, Hi Brent, for, apart from inaccurate stats, user-defined uh, user functions, and table variables, what other reasons can make the cardinality estimator produce estimates of exactly one row? Can multiple joins have something to do with it? Oh, that's a good example of how I wish I could answer something in 60 seconds. If there was an easy way to answer that, I totally would. But I've got to defer you to my Fundamentals of Query Tuning and Mastering Query Tuning classes because we cover that extensively in those classes, how you get incorrect estimates. I don't want you to think that when you see an estimate of one row, that's the only time it's incorrect because SQL Server also has things built in that will hard code estimates to exactly 10% of the table, 30% of the table, and so forth. So that's where I really have to defer you to my Fundamentals of Query Tuning class and my Mastering Query Tuning class. Now, if you want a free answer, too, uh, if you go to SQLbits.com, SQLbits.com is a conference over in the United Kingdom, and they video all their sessions and put them up online for free. If you go to SQLbits.com and you search for sessions by Dave Ballantyne, B-A-L-L-A-N-T-Y-N-E, uh, there is, SQL Bits has a, a compendium by speaker name, by conference, whatever, but you want of all of Dave Ballantyne's sessions. 
over the years, he's done several free one-hour sessions on the cardinality estimator and how it comes up with estimates and how those estimates differ from version to version. Those are mwah, too, as well. And some of them, you'll actually hear me asking questions in the class. Uh, I remember one of those SQL Bits conferences, both me and uh, Itzik ben Gan were sitting in Dave's class and had a good old time. And then let's see here, uh, last one we'll do. Do you have, oh, this is from Ingi Bjorg. Do you have any recommended guidance for creating or optimizing new VM configurations for SQL Server in an Azure VM? Is it any different than a bare metal new server configuration? Yes, and I have a brand new class on this coming out uh, depending on when you watch this video, I'll just say I have a brand new class coming out uh, running SQL Server in Amazon and Azure where I walk you through what your different deployment options are, how you go about choosing the right instance type for your workloads, how you measure your workloads before you go up into the cloud, how you choose the right instance size, how you go about buying reservations, how you choose the right backup method, and much more. So if you go to brentozar.com and you click training up at the top of the screen, look for the course running SQL Server in Amazon and Azure. All right, that brings us to another episode, end of another episode of Office Hours. I am going to go out there and, uh, well, I'm certainly not going to do with what some of those people are doing, doing kayaking out. I mean, I'm sure it looks nice out there, but I think that water's probably a little bit on the cold side. Uh, but uh, you might catch me down at one of those bars uh, having a, a drink here shortly. It's funny, you know, when Americans think of Israel, we don't, I don't think that most of us think of beaches and surfing and drinks at the Palapa bars, but uh, you got to remember that uh, Israel's a lot like New Jersey. Hold on, that sounds weird, right? But it's New Jersey in a more tropical locale, I suppose. It's about the same size as, uh, Israel's about the same size as New Jersey, about the same population, and it's got a similar layout in that a whole bunch of the country is along the coast. So it's really beautiful uh, to be here and you know think seaside. I, I wouldn't come during the summer. Uh, this is September when I record this, but I, I think the fall and winter is probably a better time to come. Of course, I was here for the Data Tel Aviv Summit, the uh, SQL Server event that they do about every year. Oh, it's so good to be back in person uh, at events and see people and see the lights go on as you, uh, as you teach them stuff. I'm also really excited. They videotaped uh, all of the sessions and they're gonna put them up on YouTube at some point. I had a session on uh, Dynamic SQL that was a ton of fun, a really lively audience. Israelis love to ask questions interactively. And so we had a whole lot of fun making fun of each other as we were uh, giving answers and asking questions. All right, so that brings us to another end of uh, Office Hours. I will see y'all next time. Adios. <laughs>